All right, good afternoon or morning or wherever it is that you are. We've got two more mini lectures and let's get to it. We have one mini lecture for each of the chapters that remain. This is the one for chapter 26 because we talked about retroviruses and we needed to say a little more about retroviruses. These are scary viruses, but they are specifically defined and we know what they do and what their genes look like that do it. And so it's important to say that because they are scary viruses, artists make art out of it. And I'm going to show you a few examples of these. Um, we also have, uh, maybe I should show these artistic examples. I haven't done it yet to uh, Dr. Delgado, who's our uh, resident virology expert. And I want to see if she's ever heard of this artist. So we'll get to that. But retroviruses are not just HIV. Here's another example, but remember that retroviruses have gag, pol, and on genes in them. Sometimes they can pick up other genes. Remember the example that we had a uh, PS2 was picked up by a cyanophage or whatever it was. Uh, the whole PS2 gene can be picked up because these are copying into a genome, then they pop out of a genome, and sometimes they can pick up other genes along for the ride. These are ways in which they are like transposons. In fact, there are even virus-like particles that exist inside cells that look like viruses that just, you know, bud off and then they go back into the genome and they, they do a lot of stuff with the genome because that's what they do. Once you have a reverse transcriptase, you can actually do all sorts of things like this. So um, you usually have long terminal repeats because remember that's how the gene gets into the genome. It gets transposed and you have um, the evidence of that in the LTRs. So you can look for those if you're looking for those in a genome. You can look for gag, pol, and onv genes and sometimes even a SARC gene will go in. If this rings a bell, it should go back to the signaling chapter that we did. SARC is one of those uh, signaling proteins that we have that actually will, I believe it's a kinase, yes. And what it will do, it basically is tyrosine specific. It affects cell division and it's present naturally, you know, in low levels in humans. And the problem is not that it's there, but that it's in the wrong place. This is a normal kinase, but it enters pretty much randomly into the genome. The virus integrates it into the genome at weird places, and then it gets turned on and it can uh, affect cell signaling turn growth on, then you have cancer. So this is how a virus can cause cancer. Thankfully, this is pretty rare, and you also have defenses against it. So um, there's, this is scary, but it's not, it's something that's been going on for billions of years. And so while it's scary, it's also um, something that is natural, you know, in the sense of natural evil, I suppose. It really is a mobile oncogene. It's just not that mobile, and the virus has a hard time getting to a place where it really causes uh, problems. But of course, this is the retrovirus that is the most infamous of all. This is HIV, and this is interesting because this is a Best Pictures of 2010 winner. The most famous coronavirus pictures that came out in 2020 were also the same exact color scheme as this. This is almost like the mascot colors of retroviruses. And if you look closely at those coronavirus pictures, they are different from the HIV. They even look different at this scale where you can't even see the exact sequences of things. HIV is a very different virus than SARS-CoV-2. But because you can have these big enough to see under a microscope or whatever the imaging technique is that you're using, you have these big differences that are enough to see. And so you can have artists that build off of that. So one artist has done the features of HIV that appear to a virologist and has put that into glass. And it's really interesting because he has a whole gallery of these called glass microbiology. And if you look up and down, you might recognize a bacteriophage. You might recognize um, other viruses or even uh, bacteria. He does microbes. It's all microbiology. And he does a giant COVID-19 because he would definitely do that. Under this scale, I can see how someone who doesn't know about viruses could be worried that this could do the things HIV does. And by the way, there might be some kind of genome uh, alteration. 
I don't want to say anything until we actually do the experiments. But what I can say is somebody who says that COVID is like HIV has got a lot to prove to me beyond just saying that, beyond just saying, oh, it's a bad disease. HIV is a specific virus that looks a specific way. And even under this magnification, you can see that COVID is, a diff is caused by a different virus. Um, that's why I think this art is actually helpful as well. It lets you see things the way scientists see them. And if you draw the con conclusion that the two viruses have some significant differences among them, that is not a wrong conclusion to draw. And that can help you be resistant to some claims that really draw similarities between places where there aren't really proven similarities. So HIV has gag pollen om genes. It's got a few other genes that we've defined um, as being important to how it works. It's been studied extensively now. It took a while for the scientists to realize that they really should study it as much as they should. And there was a long time where the scientists had to be convinced that too long where we had to be convinced to study it in uh, detail. Now that we have, we do know a lot about it that we don't know about other uh, viruses. Um, and that means that we have ways to attack it. We've even designed drugs to control it. And those drugs work pretty well. So the thing about HIV is that it's not just a retrovirus, but it uh, infects T cells which are supposed to be guarding against the retrovirus. It is a bit like invasion of the body snatchers, where it takes over the trusted T cell and it makes it, you know, it not only doesn't detect the HIV, you have immunodeficiencies in other areas. There are cancers that are associated with HIV because there are cancers that the T cells control. They're not caused directly by the HIV, and this is a more normal situation. Notice how you have some overlap, and you do have the three-time overlap that we were talking about, where you can have a short gene that actually overlaps three different ways. But for the most part, even here, you don't have that much overlap between genes, even under this extreme pressure to reduce the genome that retroviruses are under. HIV tra reverse transcriptase, of course, it's a thing. It needs it to be able to do its retrovirus thing but it's 10 times more error prone than others. Basically, HIV is incredibly sloppy. This means it mutates a lot and it gets away from the defenses that we devise against it. So not only does it infect the defending cell, it also has a huge rate of mutation, which allows it to find ways around the other cells that might respond. And of course, my favorite, uh, David Goodsell, has done a beautiful image of HIV with the different types of proteins in different colors. And the thing I want to point out about this, yeah, you can even go and you can see these are definitely different kinds of things. And you can try to figure out what the different colors are. RT, reverse transcriptase. PR is probably some kind of protease. In fact, I can tell from its shape that it's a protease. And these are the viral necessity proteins. We know what they do so we can go after them and we can even design drugs that go against them. That was actually successful. We started with structure, we ended with a drug that fit into that structure, and that is where many HIV protease inhibitors come from. So that's the other part. He uh, arranges these as far as the kind of inhibitors that we can have that go against these structures. And remember, this is a 3D puzzle type thing. These biochemical structures will fit into those biochemical structures and they will sabotage them, mess them up. They end up being good antiviral agents as a result. Notice even at this, even without zooming in too much, you can see that the structures of the two different kinds of inhibitors are very different. The ones on the top, take a look at those. You see a lot of nucleotide type structures that should look familiar to you. If you look at the bottom, you don't see a lot of nucleotide type structures. In fact, if anything, what do they look like? So they look like amino acids. So you have two different types of inhibitors that go after, they mimic different types of biomolecules. Protease inhibitors, have a, uh, they target the substrate binding site of the protease. That's what proteases do. We go after it. Reverse transcriptase, on the other hand, deals with nucleotides. So the drugs that go after it tend to look like nucleotides. The other piece of good news is these 
are general activities. They go after the general activity of the protease. They fit into the specific structure of HIV protease, but they could possibly fit into specific structure of other viral proteases if they happen to have similar enough structures at the part where they bind. So one kind of viral therapy should always be tried for another. Honestly, with COVID, I was expecting us to find more antiviral therapies, but even the ones that we found were developed for other viruses first, and then we throw them against COVID, and some of them work. I was hoping more of them would work earlier on, but I think COVID was just so divergent that it um, fewer of the things we had already found actually worked against it. And also, we had not studied coronaviruses that much. There had never been an important cor coronavirus as important to study as COVID was as urgent. Oh, now we have studied it a lot more. So I guess that's the good news. Um, we uh, hopefully will be more prepared for the next coronavirus to emerge. And there's a story about this. Uh, so I actually was involved in a book project where I wrote some of these entries for this book called 30 Second Biochemistry. One of the ones I was assigned to was a scientist who worked on this exact area. And her name was Gertrude Ellian. I... Um, uh, George Hitchings is also mentioned with her, and George Hitchings has actually provided the lab and the money and the space, but I'm convinced that the real scientific advance, the real scientist here, was Elian herself. And if you look at this, they actually investigated what turned out to be retrovirals uh, or antivirals and chemotherapeutic agents. And what they did is they started with the structures of nucleotides. Then they messed with them and they threw them at the things and they saw if they bound or inhibited the viral replication. When they found a hit, they made new versions with slightly different structures of each of them. So um, there's one in particular called 2,6-diaminopurine. And by the way, if you just, uh, I don't even show you the structure of that yet, but you should know it's a purine with two amino groups on it. Okay, that sounds like a nucleotide type thing that would go after a reverse transcriptase type enzyme. It was uh, the thing about these, sometimes they work too well. They kill healthy cells as well as the, the diseased agents. And so um, they were, this one was too toxic. And it took 20 years that Elian was trying these different things, and she was always trying purine related molecules. So she would synthesize things with organic chemistry and put them against and test them with biochemistry and virology. And she ended up developing thioguanine, azathioprine, and allopurinol. Look at the purine, purine in there, guanine in the other one. And during the 1950s, basically biochemists basically learned more about the biochemical pathways, and it would actually help them take the toxic agent and see how to make it less toxic. They had an idea, they tested it, and one of their ideas actually worked. So it ended up being a cyclovir. If you ever end up with um, using that as a doctor, know that that was traced back to Gertrude Ellian herself and is based on a nucleotide. There's also other purine-based things. Just based on purines, you can make drugs against cancer, leukemia, and gout. And uh, so because nucleotides are involved in all these things, so there's just the chance that this particular structure will affect the disease but not normal cells, not nearly as much, then you have a drug. These are their structures, and you can see hopefully the purine structure in all of these, or most of these. Some of them it's a little bit harder to see, but trust me, it works that way. And you can see the different diseases that they go after. But something like um, acyclovir, allopurinol, all those things, they have the purine ring. And that's why you need to learn about nucleotides before you learn about drugs, because drugs are based on the structures of life. That's the detail that you know about structures of life leads you to understand and maybe even develop new drugs. So one of the famous drugs about HIV was AZT. This was sort of a first generation drug and it caused all sorts of side effects. It was really bad. I even know someone who claims that HIV wasn't real, but AZT caused it. Obviously that's not true now, but HIV reverse transcriptase is what is targeted by this. It does actually do its job. It just does a lot of other jobs too, because look at it. 
It's basically a pyrimidine rather than a purine, and it's got an azide group on it. That's a reactive group, forms covalent bonds, basically messes everything up that binds it. It's just because the HIV is replicating, when it's actively replicating, you send this at it and it messes up the HIV. Hopefully it messes the HIV up more than normal enzymes. But you can see how a normal enzyme would pick that up. It'd be like, oh, here's a nucleotide. Oh no, it attacked me. You know, it's that kind of thing. So it's a prime target for drug design to go after reverse transcriptase with this exact kind of strategy. Make nucleotide modifications or if you're going after a protease, make amino acid modifications. So um, it turns out that we have now designed specific things that specifically go after viral proteases but do not bind any major protein in the uh, human body otherwise. The more specific your therapy, the better a therapy it will be and the fewer side effects you're going to have. So just remember that transposons and uh, retroviruses are very similar. There's even a, like a, retro, a transposable element that you look at it, it's got the same long terminal repeats, and it looks like it has like a mutated GAG gene and a mutated Paul gene that billions of years ago found their way into the genome, and it still hops around the genome because it's still got those long terminal repeats, but it's no longer able to form an infectious virus. Here's a copia element in Drosophila. This even forms virus-like particles inside the cell. I don't believe these particles can ever leave the cell, but they have this little virus cycle where they even develop a capsid, and then they go back into the nucleus, and then they, um, they jump around in it again. The good news is these aren't really infectious in the classical sense, but they do mess with your genome. Your genome is being messed with all the time, and these things are jumping in and out of it and we see the evidence of that. I saw something like 10% of the genome looks like a, a particular transposon, and you know, that's far more than your protein coding regions. So these jump around. When you see long terminal repeats, you know something is jumping around, integrating and re-unintegrating from the genome. And introns also have the same kind of idea. Why do we have so many introns? Well, because they just splice themselves out so they don't really affect things and they just jump around. But once in a while, they land in the wrong place and they might actually affect things. And finally, some phages actually use a different kind of protein called RNA replicase. And if you look at this, this is like chapter 25, but it's with RNA instead of DNA. It's like DNA polymerase and it reproduces the RNA genome just like DNA polymerase reproduces a DNA genome. If you uh, look at the phages that have this, they tend to have single-stranded RNA genomes. And so how do they replicate it? They have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that works off of single strands. You don't have hardly any single-stranded RNA in your cell that is a template for it. So it can be pretty sure if it's doing this that it's mostly replicating its own. And, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't care. It's surviving. Viruses don't care about you. So RNA replicates. Viruses are the ultimate selfish element. They only care about themselves. Uh, RNA replicates. It has four subunits, and one is from the viral RNA, and three are proteins recruited from the host cell that it needs to have that activity. And so, uh, but again, the virus doesn't care. It works. You have those proteins around. It steals them. It can only copy RNA, it can't copy DNA, and it must be specific. It has some kind of specificity for viral RNA. I believe this specificity might be for a single-stranded RNA, but I'm not sure. Uh, it must have some kind of way to tell what RNA it should copy because it wants to only copy viral RNA. It would spend all its time copy copying host cell RNA if it did not have a mechanism like that. And so that's the key. When you have something like this, how does it work? You want to look for the tell that it uses so that it knows what to replicate because it's only going to replicate itself. And that is where the end of chapter 26.